besides the fundamental science, which is what drives me, there are practical applications that that come out of this. And those practical applications could change the world. But in order to develop them, we, we need we need funding. For example, we can we can get electricity uh, from water and light. And it, it's similar to the uh, the way plants uh, get get their energy uh, from water and from from light. And that's the first step of photosynthesis, which is 100 percent efficient. We have something similar to that, if if not uh, that, and we have proof of principle. You can stick electrodes into certain regions of the water that become oppositely charged. The structured, so-called structured water, which we now call EZ or fourth phase water, is negatively charged, and the region beyond that, where you have ordinary liquid water, is positively charged. And so we stuck one electrode in the negative, one electrode in the positive, and we demonstrated that we could light a light bulb or actually a light emitting diode it's it's really it's really astonishing to see so this has this has um um promise to solve the problems of the world and getting electricity it's so simple and all entirely renewable but in order to develop it it's necessary to get funding Welcome to Wellness Spring, our one-stop shop for education, inspiration, motivation, and optimal wellness. Learn from top experts and exceptional people. Welcome to Wellness Spring. Today, I am very honored and blessed to be speaking with Dr. Gerald Pollack, who is one of the greatest minds on the planet today. And I am so grateful to a couple of communal friends, Jeffrey Granville for introducing us, and also Michiko Hayashi. So Dr. Gerald Pollack is a water scientist and a professor of bioengineering at the Washington University. And he's also a multi award winning author. He's the founding editor in chief of the journal Water and convener of the annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water, and executive director of the Institute of Venture Science. His interests have ranged broadly from biological motion and cell biology to the interaction of biological services and aqueous solutions. His book in 1990, Muscles and Molecules, Uncovering the Principles of Biological Motion, won an Excellence Award from the Society for Technical Communications. And his 20, no, 2001 book, Cells, Gels, and Engines of Life, and his newest book, The Fourth Phase of Water, Beyond Solid, Liquid and Vapor won the Society's Distinguished Award, their highest distinction. And I'm I've read the book and currently rereading it, and I can highly recommend it to anyone because what I loved about the book is that he's he starts by saying it's very suitable for lay people, people like myself that haven't studied scientists at a high level and for anyone. So it's absolutely brilliant. And this book has also went on to receive the World Summit Excellence Award. In 2015, he won the Brand Laureate Award, previously bestowed on notables such as Nelson Mandela, Hillary Clinton and Stephen Jobs. In 2016, he was awarded the Emoto Inaugural Peace Prize, and more recently, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Chapel Natural Philosophy Society. He appears briefly in the 2016 Travis Rice Sports Action Film, which I'm putting on my list to watch, The Fourth Phase, which was named after his recent book. 
And he is also, he's included in the 2019 listing OM magazine as one of the world's 100 most inspiring people. And I know we're in for a wonderful, inspirational chat today because he's just a wealth of knowledge. Also, in his bio, he, in 2020, he presented his work at the Majlis by invitation from the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi at his royal palace. So, welcome, dear Jerry, to... Oh. Well, well thank, no spring. You for, <laughs> thank you for that ultra kind uh, introduction. And now that you've used up all the time, I guess uh, we have no time left for discussion. <laughs> uh, so happy to be with you and um, happy, happy to uh, to feel as though I'm in Australia. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> uh, but uh, happy to be going there in a few months and um, Etc. Anyway, just delighted. Thank you for your kindness. Um, Pleasure. Um, before we delve into your great achievements, could you please tell the listeners about your background so they can get to know you? Uh, well, you know, where should I start? Um, so I, I guess my um, uh, professional background, I, I started by studying electrical engineering. And um, and I went on from there to to become uh, to to join uh, well to study my graduate degree in bioengineering that is a combination of engineering and biology at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and then I went on to where I, I exist today, not Washington University because Washington University is in St. Louis, Missouri. And the University of Washington is in, in in Seattle. There are so many universities in the U.S. named after George Washington uh, that it's really confusing. Even in the state of Washington, uh, there's the University of Washington. There's Western Washington uh, University. Uh, uh, there's a Central Washington <laughs> University, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's also George Washington University, which which is in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. They're all over the place. Uh, but the institution uh, to which I belong is the University of Washington. And um, it's a very nice place. It's a lovely view and uh, academically uh, interesting in environment. OK, so I started my career uh, at the University of Washington interested in, in muscles and how muscles contract. Um, the not not in in terms of kinesiology and uh, gross muscle function, but at the molecular level, how the molecules of actin and myosin interact with with one another to produce motion and force. And um, well, I, I quickly got into some controversial territory because because uh, the prevailing theory um, was put forth by a famous distinguished Nobel laureate, Sir Andrew Huxley, a member of the distinguished Huxley family uh, from, from England. And Andrew Huxley went on to, to um, become, it went, not only won a Nobel Prize, the only one in his family, uh, but he also became uh, the, the president of the Royal Society. Uh, and master of Trinity College in Cambridge. And he had every distinction. And when he would walk into the room, there was a hush. It, it was as though God had entered the room. And, uh, and so unfortunately, uh, we and, and others found evidence that his theory was bankrupt. It simply didn't fit the evidence. This was a little bit awkward because, because uh, he was such a, his past is a, he was such a distinguished uh, person that uh, challenging him uh, w was a challenge for the challenger because you know if you if, if you challenge God you you don't get get too far and I spent several decades doing it and practically every piece of evidence that we obtained simply did not fit fit the theory and I did go on to write a book uh, uh, it's called Muscles and Molecules in 1990. Uh, discussing the issues and explaining why why the theory simply failed and other ideas that 
you know, that might supplant uh, that theory that simply didn't work. Uh, but he was revered by so many people that any alternative uh, viewpoint ran into a difficulty because, uh, you, you know, if you, if, you, if you simply look at the evidence, uh, I believe uh, the, the answer that you'd come to is pretty clear. The theory simply doesn't work. But a lot of people were not so interested in looking at the evidence. It was more, you know, you're, you're in the field and you've got a choice to make. You can either go with, with the um, rebels or radicals, uh, or uh, you can go with the mainstream. And the mainstream, in, 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 that, in, that sense, in that case, was headed by Sir Andrew Huxley. And many of the people gravitated in that direction. So although, in my view, the evidence was clear, uh, the, the people in the field mostly gravitated in that direction. They simply closed their eyes and didn't didn't really bother to look at the evidence. So I left the field, and it, it wasn't it, it wasn't that I departed out of frustration. Um, you know, if, if that's the way it went, that's the way. But I was inspired. It was a it was a conference that took place in in Hungary, and a Hungarian colleague invited uh, me. And the conference was to commemorate the life, he had died recently, of uh, a, a biophysicist. His name was Ernst. And, and he had two areas of interest. One was muscle contraction and the other was water. And his viewpoint on both of those uh, was not mainstream. Uh, so they invited me to speak about muscle. Uh, I was the only one invited to do so. And you know, I, I presented, I presented the reasons why I, I thought that this towering Nobel laureate was, um, in fact, simply wrong. You know, um, it, it, many of the people would consider him to be practically a deity, but, but you know, he's just another human being. Uh, you know, he eats the same food we eat and pees in the same pot as the rest of us and et cetera, et cetera. It's just that he was famous. And so he, he, it is possible <laughs> that this great guru could be wrong. Uh, so I, I presented the evidence that he might be wrong, and I think it was reasonably well received. But what impacted me more than that was hearing about water. And so it was uh, Gilbert Ling, who, who is known to some people, not, not so many, but Gilbert was a scientist of, of exceptional uh, I wouldn't say distinction because that's not the right word, but capability, we say. He was chosen. There was a cohort of scientists who, who came from China. It was after World War II. It was 1948. And they, they looked throughout all of China to find the most promising, the three most promising young scientists to study in the U.S. One of them was a physicist. That was Yang, C.N. Yang, who went on to win a Nobel Prize. The second was a chemist who, I'm told, won a Nobel Prize. And the third one was Gilbert Ling, a biologist, who should have won two Nobel Prizes at least, but, uh, but he was rejected, reviled, rejected, uh, uh, because he was too radical. And his, his viewpoint, which was presented at that Hungarian meeting, his viewpoint was, in biology, the water is not like, um, like this stuff in my glass. He said, you know, the liquid water, the molecules are randomly oriented and bouncing around a fierce number of times each second or even each femtosecond. And he said, uh, no, 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 the evidence is different. The evidence is that this is organized like a crystal, like a liquid crystal. He didn't use the term liquid crystal, but he said, you know, the water molecule can be represented as a dipole, that is, something that looks like a little bean with plus at one end, minus the other end. And uh, if you have beans like that, uh, you can imagine they could stack uh, with the positive of one bean attracted to the negative of the other bean. So you could stack quite a ways. And Gilbert had a lot of evidence for this so-called structuring of water. He called it structured water. And, and uh, at the same conference were perhaps a dozen people who had evidence to support that point of view. I was amazed. I was completely uh, taken aback by all the evidence, and you know, as uh, uh, and and so I was I was stimulated to to you know carry out further studies of this stuff because it seemed so interesting. 
So I, when I came back, I, I gave one of his books to uh, several of my students to look over and their response, the responses were uniform. Uh, if this guy is right, and it looks like he might be right, then all of biology is wrong. Because, you know, biology is built on the, 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 the idea that inside the cell is ordinary liquid water and molecules can float around, diffuse, whatever, through the water. But if the water is like this crystal, then molecules can't move around. Um, um, and, and, and so this is so fundamental to all of biology that... Um, it seemed to them, and therefore to me also, so interesting. And it was so interesting that I decided the first thing I decided to do was write a book. And the book is called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. Uh, the purpose of the book was to present Gilbert Ling's ideas, largely to present Gilbert Ling's ideas in a palatable way. Now, Gilbert, uh, brilliant as he was, he died at age just almost sh just shy of a hundred a couple of years ago um mm. somehow the, his english vocabulary was limited and he never heard of the word editing <laughs> when you <laughs> write a book you know anybody who writes a book uh, um, edits the book uh, edits the manuscript and sometimes sometimes many many times over uh, until you you know you get it just right and by getting it just right it means your your facts are right, but also the message that you're conveying is understandable and palatable to to someone who's not necessarily um, in your field or isn't so deeply educated as you were. And I I decided that um, you know I, I I may not have have a a, a full and complete knack of doing so of of, of writing, but I thought. Gilbert is way out there. His ideas are amazing. I've got to do something to help. And so I wrote the book. And the first half of the book describes Gilbert Ling's um, ideas and passions and whatever. And he didn't like the book. Uh, I thought he might like the book. I dedicated it to him. And I mentioned him many times throughout the book. And, and he was angry with me because I kind of stole his thunder, uh, he thought. And he claimed that I failed to mention him, he expected me to mention him in every paragraph, practically, and you know, <laughs> there's, there's a mm -hmm. limit. So, and he he really was angry, and it took a decade of uh, my uh, uh, attempts to restore our friendship before I was actually able to do do so. And unfortunately, this is a bit of Gilbert's personality. You know, he 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 tended to be somewhat arrogant and. And because of his arrogance, it, it, the it, arrogance doesn't necessarily work in favor of, of others uh, 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 glomming on to your unconventional ideas. Usually modesty works better than arrogance. You know, you can't come across saying, I'm right, you're wrong, and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work. So, so I tried to present it that way. And the book, book was received with mixed mixed uh, uh, responses. Uh, some of the people who knew of Gilbert Ling and his work, uh, they said, pay no attention to this book. It's nonsense. We all know that Gilbert Ling is a crackpot. And therefore, any book that's designed to describe Gilbert Ling's work must likewise be a crackpot. And on the other side, there were um, quite a few positive views, the, the best of which came from uh, uh, a cell biologist from Harvard, University who said this book is a 304 page preface to the future of cell biology. I like that one better. <laughs> um, you know, so at any rate, um, after writing the book, uh, you know, si since since this was so critical, all of all this stuff, I, I we started doing experiments and. And so um, I think maybe it, it's best if I stop at this point because I've already used up so much time describing what you what you asked for, which is how, what's your background? How did you get into all this stuff? So that's how we got into into all this stuff. And yeah, well, you did cover a lot, and um, I'm just fascinated because it is a cutthroat um industry with science and you're you're very vulnerable it's almost like you're naked because everybody's micromanaging and checking and 
so forth. And then, like you said, Sir Andrew Huxley was like a god, and you challenged him. That takes a lot of bravery and courage to face someone and challenge them, knowing that you know you could be wiped off the um, scene, if you like. Absolutely. So how did that feel? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, uh, um, um, it, the, the emotions were, were, were mixed. I, I had truth on my side. It was, it was so clear from so many experiments uh, that didn't fit that, unfortunately, uh, theory was wrong. I, I began my career, career being attracted to, to the theory. Uh, you know, a uh, theory by a famous yeah. Nobel laureate, a very important, but it just didn't work. And so I felt, uh, um, I felt buoyed by the fact that we had truth on our side. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I also felt a bit intimidated, especially at first, because this was a great man, and who 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 was I? <laughs> you know, just a, a young young scientist. But uh, and I I remember. When I first met him, I, I went. I took a trip to London. We had three different experiments, really fundamental experiments that didn't agree with his theory, and I, I wanted to present it to him and discuss with him. And I remember going to London and uh, sitting, sitting on a bench uh, a, a kilometer or so from his his laboratory, and feeling um, a trepidation. Uh, I'm going to meet the the, the great Nobel scientist and uh, who am I you know uh, so fully intimidated so I went and he greeted me pleasantly and we spent three hours uh, discussing the experimental results and he was really interested in the details of the experimental result I, I mean he was a, a genuine a scientist and I respected that and there was another guy who worked with him who just sat there quietly um, in the presence of maybe feeling intimidated himself and the president in the, in the presence of the great man didn't say a word and after three hours um we had enough and maybe he was hungry i don't know <laughs> but we, we stopped and he turned around and there was a little cabinet behind him and he pulled out a bottle of sherry uh distributed three three glasses uh, poured the sherry and we drank it and he was i mean he was happy uh even though i was challenging him and i came I came to realize uh, that this poor man was was sitting in an ivory tower, and he was so important that nobody would challenge him. And and when you're so important <laughs> that nobody challenges you, you're really isolated. And I I I and he he's a kind of shy uh, person, uh, obviously highly intelligent, but but also a, a bit shy. And when someone comes and says, hey, you know, we have some results. And so he wants to hear every word. And as a scientist, he, he wanted to hear details and talk about them. But, but the, the bottom line uh, was that he was thrilled to have this discussion because he almost never has this discussion. He's the great scientist. We bow down to him. We don't challenge him. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt gratified that I was in no such position. Everybody challenges me. I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm in, in the thick of it. So um, anyway, um, that gives you, uh, uh, so I, I can't remember what was your what was your question? Yeah, what was it like to be oh, like yeah. being in his yeah. um, presence and challenging him at a young age and knowing that your career could be on the line? Right. You know, well, so. my career. Yeah, this is a this is definitely in a uh, career is definitely an issue. And uh, I was I was fortunate. And, in you know, I had quite a few students and the students um, re reached re exalted positions. And when I applied for a grant, it often was one of my students on on the review board. And fortunately, and so I, I consistently was was able to get funding. That's not true anymore. Um, um, mm -hmm. I, I have uh, opponents uh, in in the uh, field of, of water, and even in my own department, there are three uh, uh, faculty members who are actively against pretty much everything everything we do. And 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 I wouldn't say they're hostile, but uh, scientifically they're 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 hostile, making it, and they're they're free to pass on uh, their sentiments to anybody who wants to listen throughout the university or, or e even beyond. So it's uh, it's not a, you might say, a friendly place. And I've 
kind of gravitated to doing doing our, our, our work. Uh, mainly, I spend the time home, which is where I am right now. And I, you know, I can do whatever needs mm -hmm. to be done, communicating with the students and postdocs, and, and so by by Zoom. Occasionally, I. I go into my laboratory, but it's a, not a particularly welcoming place. And, and they had a, they've had a, um, a, a quite a, a, an impact on on people at the university. Many of them know about us, and you know the reaction is, "Oh yeah, they, this guy is doing crazy stuff. I, I stay away." That that's the environment, and they've had an impact beyond just the uh, uh, department. On the other hand, so many people have taken up this stuff with enthusiasm uh, and it's great. And the, 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 the problem, the problem is getting funded. Uh, and, and, you know, because we're challenging the people who do the reviews, uh, you can imagine what it's yeah. like, you know, uh, the, the French revolutionaries coming to Louis the 16th and we have we have a bone to pick with you. Oh, yeah, tell me everything. I'm delighted. It doesn't work. It doesn't exactly uh, work work that way. When you step on the toes of people, they, they're they pained and they, they'll react. They'll say, ouch, and, and maybe do something to, to take care of the, of, of the issue. And so I had, uh, I was fortunate to have, have uh, uh, a, a uh, benefactor he came to me. I, I didn't know who, who he was. He said, I like your work. I want to fund you. And, and the guy is a billionaire. So for, I think, six or seven years, he funded us amply. And then, unfortunately, he ran into some financial difficulties and he had to stop. So we're now, we're now in a position where we have very little, uh, very little funding and we're operating on a shoestring. And we're trying to get uh, additional money. And, you know, so, so many people who, um, who hear my various presentations they said how, how could it how could it be possible that you can't get money well the reason we can't get money is is not due to the, to the science that's involved it's it's due to the fact that we get reviewed by by those who have a stake in maintaining the status quo um you know if we're right they're wrong and therefore they're not enthusiastic about being generous and giving us a score that's high enough to get funded so so this is a big problem and you know we there there uh, besides the fundamental science which is what drives me there are practical applications that that come out of this and those practical applications could change the world but in order to develop them we, we need we need funding for example we can we can get electricity uh, from water and light, and it, it's similar to the uh, the way plants uh, get get their energy uh, from water and from from light. And that's the first step of photosynthesis, which is 100% efficient. We have something similar to that, if if not uh, that, and we have proof of principle. You can stick electrodes into certain regions of the water that become oppositely charged, the structured, so-called structured water, which we now call EZ or fourth phase water, is negatively charged. And the region beyond that, where you have ordinary liquid water, is positively charged. And so we stuck one electrode in the negative, one electrode in the positive, and we demonstrated that we could light a light bulb, or actually a light emitting diode. It's it's really it's really astonishing to see. So this has this has um, um, promise to solve the problems of the world and getting electricity. It's so simple and all entirely renewable. But in order to develop it, it's necessary to get funding, and uh, and and uh, it's hard because it's based on uh, principles that various people feel intimidated by, um, don't don't like it, but. This has a future, and also we also have proof of principle uh, in a filtration. We have a filtration device that again comes out of the fundamental science. It has no physical filter. Um, it's like wow. a, I'd say I, I, I hesitate to use the term, but like a black box, and you put w water, contaminated water, in, and and that water uh, divides in into fourth phase water, uh, and ordinary water in the fourth phase water it's called easy or exclusion zone water because it excludes 
it excludes contaminants. And we tap that water, we pull it out, and we have clean water. So you put in uh, uh, contaminated water with pharmaceuticals or, or microplastics or what have you, and, and using only the energy from the sun, and uh, basically, uh, you can you can filter the water, so to speak, and 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 get um, uncontaminated drinking water. We call this a filterless filter. And again, you know, it has somewhat promise, but it it needs it needs funding to develop. And the real price, uh, this filtration device, we think uh, we have preliminary evidence that it separates salt in the way it would separate contaminants um, and. So you could put ocean water in and get drinking water out. Um, wow. You can do that now with reverse osmosis, but the amount of energy that you need to put in in order to do this is extraordinary and is simply not affordable by, uh, uh, except for example, in the Middle East where oil runs like water, so to speak. Uh, mm. and, and so, you know, thinking about achieving this uh, from the energy of the sun, um, uh, like the Middle East, where we got lots of sunshine, uh, but you don't have much drinking water. So you can take ocean water, salt water, and create it. What I'm trying to tell you and illustrate is out of the science, out of this, you might say, radical revolutionary science uh, comes practical applications. And and we're we're not necessarily into uh, doing the engineering of um, these practical applications, but in order to achieve them, there's still some fundamental science that needs to be worked out. And what we'd like to do is work that out because it will not only provide a basis, a platform for developing these by some commercial entity, but also it will teach us uh, a lot about fundamental science. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a long speech to let you know that that this fourth phase of water idea, you know, initially we we thought this is a purely biological um, explanation or, or issue, but it extends so far uh, beyond biology to issues of worldwide practicality. And uh, we wish we had we the wherewithal, because you need people, people cost money to develop all this stuff. It, it would be, I, I think, um, amazing. Uh, maybe, uh, again, I probably deviated from whatever question you asked. Um, <laughs> That's all right. No, it's interesting for the listeners to know, and um, maybe there's someone out there listening that is passionate about saving our planet because water is vital for life and clean water. And you've um, managed to hit the nail on the head like I liked looking at your experiment with the two beakers where you put the electrodes in and seeing the exclusion zone and also the experiment with, that you do with the bridge with the drop of water. And I can understand where you're coming from because um, I'm also a functional breathing instructor and nobody, the medical science doesn't want to put money into it because it's backed all the research is backed by pharmaceutical companies. And if they can't make money, if you can heal yourself through breathing exercises, there's no tablets or surgery involved. So they're not going to invest in it. And even though it's simple and it's something everybody can do, it's affordable to everyone because the exercises, once you've learned them, you, you can be healthy for life. You be in the driving seat of your life. And the same with you with water and also because you covered a lot. Um, I agree with you, even everybody has to have the same basic needs of eating, drinking, sleeping and going to the toilet. And we do put people on a pedestal, but I believe that we are all sovereign. We're all, you know, we chose to come here when we die. Um, it's only our physical body that dies and then our spirit or soul or whatever you want to call it goes back to the universe and I'm fascinated about water because now lots of people are saying water is consciousness and I know 
Mr. Emoto and many, since then, many of the scientists, like he made the observations doing the experiments where you put um, water in Petri dishes with the different names and you could see for the positive words, beautiful sacred geometry shapes and in the crystals and then more murky water in tap water. But um, I sent you an email because a friend who lives in Brazil, the water is so disgusting there. They're trying to work on it. You know, it, most people don't want to drink bottled water or they can't afford bottled water. So what you're offering is a solution because in Europe right now, there's a lot of droughts, the rivers are drying up. So you're offering a, a solution to the world crisis with um, droughts and contaminated water because even like in the air that we breathe, there's a lot of pollutants. So, and then that ends up in the water. So um, would you like to explain what the easy water is? Sure, sure. I, yeah, we, we, we deviated <laughs> from that. I, that maybe perhaps should have come, come first. So um, is it, it, to, to describe, it's probably better uh, if I start with the experiment that we did and what we saw. Yeah. So it started from Gilbert Ling's idea uh, that the water in, in cells, water in biology, uh, is is structured in some ways, organized, is not not random, and it's like a crystal. And you know, when when crystals form, if if the crystal is pure, it's it it, it can be pure only if whatever contaminants had been in it get excluded uh, from it. And and so we were looking for a, a preparation where um, a, a water of some sort where where particles or molecules were excluded. That, that was the, the 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 premise, and we found it pretty quickly. What we did is we took an experimental chamber, and in the chamber we put a gel, um, like gelatin dessert. It wasn't that, but it's kind of like that. And we added water, and we we put some particles, little spheres called microspheres, in the water, very tiny. Uh, and we looked in the microscope, and we found that adjacent to the gel, uh, there was a a region of water where all the microspheres were excluded and we could watch it uh, with with a video and we could see or with our naked eye and we could see that that zone which we called exclusion zone because it excluded the, the zone uh, kept kept growing and uh, you know and reached a, a, a stage where it, it was actually rather large on a molecular uh, scale at first, it was 50 micrometers or so, which is the thickness of half of one of your hairs. Uh, um, and, and later, we began to see larger ones up to even a millimeter. Um, you know, so by molecular standards, that's practically infinite. Um, wow. and, and so we started studying that, that kind of water, and we found a few, a few critical things. First of all, its properties. Uh, differed remarkably from all the properties that we could measure of uh, of liquid liquid water, and that's when we began calling it fourth phase water because it was not ordinary liquid water. Um, and then, to our great surprise, uh, we found that this was not neutral. Uh, so ordinary water H two O is neutral. We stuck electrodes directly into this zone. And we found that typically, not always, typically it's negatively charged. And we found that the region uh, beyond this microsphere free uh, region, the easy region, the region beyond was full of positive charge, equal positive charge. And so what we surmise is that the water molecule, which, which started the whole thing, it was broken into um, uh, OH minus and H plus. The H plus was in uh, in in the ordinary liquid, or we say bulk water, and the OH minus is gathered together to form this exclusion zone. Um, and so we had negative next to positive. Negative usually doesn't like to sit next to positive. The two will combine, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. in this case, they didn't recombine um, for a very long time. They stayed apart from one another, and that's a characteristic of a battery. Uh, okay. And we 
uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we could stick electrodes in the in the e negative EZ and the positive region beyond, and and get electrical current out of that. Um, so you know, pr proof of uh, principle, and we were we were quite excited about that. So what it means is uh, you know, biologically, if you if your cells are filled with this uh, kind of uh, easy water, easy has negative charge, and your cells also have negative charge. And uh, a question arises: Is the negative charge of the cell does that derive from the negative charge of the water? And I think the answer is yes, although uh, conventional biology says that the reason for the negative charge of the cell has nothing to do with that and everything to do with uh, membrane pumps and channels. And I've published reasons why I think that's grossly erroneous. And a very simple explanation is that the cell is filled with easy water, which is negatively charged. So because you've got a lot of negative charges together, uh, you know, when you put them together, all they want to do is escape from one another. They repel. And if they had if they had an opportunity, uh, they would do exactly that. And so the fact that they're co uh, condensed together creates potential energy. And um, I've shown that this kind of potential energy, uh, it's in the book, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, is critically important for running the cell. Um, when the cell is activated to do whatever whatever it does, uh, if it's a muscle cell, it contracts, if it's a secretory cell, it secretes, et cetera, et cetera, that um, part of the driving force, or uh, at least some, uh, all, I don't, I, I don't know, is it derives from that energy, that potential energy that's in the cell. And when you think of uh, people who don't eat, you know, uh, breatharians, uh, where do they yeah. get their energy? So, um, they, obviously, if they don't eat, they don't get it from food. Uh, they must get it from somewhere. And I think a, a distinct possibility is that they get it from the potential energy of that easy water that's in the cell. And if they take take in um, energy from uh, sunshine or infrared energy is what we found is the builder. Uh, uh, it's what constructs this fourth phase water and separates the charge. And it's all infrared energy is all around us. Uh, if it if it uh, it comes through that, it's possible that that's that's actually where their energy uh, comes from. And um, so uh, all of this, of course, remains to to be explored. But I think um, you know it needs an explanation. There are many people who simply don't eat uh, for periods of time. I think you're one of those. Uh, are you? Uh, yeah. No, I'm not. But my friend oh, well. Jas Mahin. Um, oh. She, I have over the years done fasting, but I've usually had um, drinks of water. I've done a water fast and juice fast and different things over the years. But Jasmine is probably out of the three original leaders um, because your friend Jane has passed, uh, Praha Jane, who was 75 years as a breatharian. She's Jasmine must be about 35 years now. And she told me that there's 220,000 people on the planet at the moment who are practicing breatharianism. Really? And another, yeah, and another 550 in training. And she said in the atmospheric air, especially if you're in a humid climate, that you get two liters a day just from breathing in the air. But they do um, salute to the sun, like yoga exercises, and they're drawing on the energy of the source. And they're all perfectly healthy. They're super fit. Like I caught up with her in person in Sydney a few months ago, and I, I couldn't stop looking at her because she's shining so brightly and she radiating good health. And um, she doesn't eat or drink. And it's like, wow, how can this be possible? But it works. And I had a French friend who was a breatharian for a while and he gave a talk at one of my events. And, you know, people will always disbelieve. And it's like with your friend Ling that you were talking about, didn't know about the word editing. We come from different cultures. We're living in a multicultural um, world. And 
you know, what's um, good for me might not be good for you, could be rude or impolite and our way of thinking and our upbringing. But yeah, to get people to change their minds about um, living off air, you know, and the sun, but there's power in the sun, you know, and there's power in the air. And there's a lot of religious people who think that spirit is in the air that we breathe and consciousness is in the air that we breathe and there's water everywhere. And as you say, the planet is about 70% water and we're about 70% water. And I believe I've heard you say um, out of each cell, um, each cell is 99% water. Well, 99%, um, just to make that clear, the cell is... Uh, by volume, uh, roughly yeah. two thirds water. But um, you know, if you convert by volume to by the number of molecules, see, in order to fill that two thirds uh, with water molecules, the water molecule is so small that you need a lot of water molecules. So if you were to line up all the molecules in your body one by one and start counting, you, you might count 99 out of 100 will be water molecules uh, to make up that two thirds uh, volume, uh, people get confused by by those two determinations, and the numbers that you get out of them differ. Whether you you talk about number of molecules or the volume, uh, so yeah, it's uh, and I just have a, a comment to make on on the humid air. So, so the humid air is uh, it, it is filled with water, and in my fourth phase book, um, I demonstrate uh, that that. Uh, the the water that's in in the atmosphere is not single molecule. There may be some single molecules of water, but a lot of the water that evaporates is, is actually little droplets, and it's a actually confirmed uh, using videography. Tiny droplets that that evaporate. You could see that in um, if you go into, for example, a, a coffee shop, um, and and you you know you can see the vapor that's coming up out of the hot hot coffee or, or hot tea if you have a dark background mm -hmm. and um you you your your eyes uh, um can't detect uh, anything in the air and, uh, or anything unless it's bigger than the wavelength of light roughly the wavelength of light is about half a micrometer or something like that and so the fact that you could see the vapor coming out of the coffee means can't be a single molecule. It must be giant clusters of some kind that are at least a half a micrometer or one micrometer. Uh, and there are actually people who have photographed it. It's actually 30 or 40 uh, micrometers, which is, I don't know, a gazillion molecules of water uh, must be. But we found that a droplet of water, uh, that droplets are surrounded by easy shells. So if you mm -hmm. have a, a droplet, it's got like an onion layers uh, surrounding it and the inside is liquid and you've got positive charges inside that are pushing on this membrane and the membrane of easy water is holding it together. And that's why you have a sphere. Uh, that's why a droplet is a, is, is a sphere. But the easy, the, the, the easy it contains energy because it has charge and the droplet itself has a negative charge in the membrane and positive charge inside the droplet, so you have the separated charge, which is energy, potential energy, because positive and negative ultimately want to coalesce, uh, and, and and so um, when when you say I wasn't aware of this that that breatharians are often like um, uh, are in humid environments, this is a source of energy that that they get uh, of easy energy from the droplets of water that are are being evaporated in, in the warm, humid, humid air. So thank you mm -hmm. for that piece of information. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's all right. And I, I'm curious to know, because over the years, people have told me that we can't absorb all the water that we drink because some of them, uh, the molecules are too big to be accepted to ourselves. Is that true or a myth? Um, well, I, 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 haven't, I haven't heard that. Uh, it it sounds to me like uh, uh, it could be a, a myth, uh, but I, I I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, but we know you know some of the water that we take in gets peed out, um, yeah. And much of the water that we we 
we we take in becomes EZ water. Uh, and the reason that it does that is that uh, most of the, sur the solid surfaces inside our cells and outside are so-called hydrophilic, water-loving. And those are the kinds of surfaces that build easy water from ordinary liquid water. And the, our bodies are filled with them even and inside our cells. So when you, when you drink water um, and the water finds itself next to any one of those surfaces, it's going to build easy water. And so, you know, I think that basically Gilbert Ling was correct in, 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 in saying that the water that's inside our cells is structured water, but we've given new new meaning or new definition to uh, structured water and what it means. And it, it it's actually we, we now call it easy or fourth phase water, which which is different from what Gilbert Ling was saying. Is this thematically it's the same, but we found that its properties. It has such interesting properties that that uh, that make it uh, uh, make it a, a um, a storage side for energy uh, to provide energy for our body. So our cells, our cells are filled with it. And you know, if our cells are not filled with it, uh, then our cells are dysfunctional, or even pathological. Mm. So a, a, a therapeutic route um, uh, for for many people is to build easy water in your cells. And and there are you know a half dozen different ways that we we know very simple ways that to do this. Uh, and and um can you give people, us one example uh okay one example only one uh, <laughs> six okay one uh sauna or as the the finns say sauna and as the russians yeah. say banya and uh, so what is that well it's hot right and heat is essentially the same as infrared energy uh uh, not exactly the same, but basically the, the same. So, uh, you know, in your, in your hot oven, you see the glowing red coils and you say, yeah. well, it's generating infrared energy and you feel the heat and you can see the or orange glow, all that. And, but, but it's more than, than just your oven or your toaster. It's all around you. And you could, you could actually uh, confirm that uh, by turning off all the lights in your room. So neither you nor your cell phone uh, camera could record anything or see anything, but if you were to whip out a camera with an infrared sensor instead of a visible light sensor, you you get a beautiful image of everything around you, even in complete darkness. And that's because the infrared energy is is joining. So, so if you're sitting in a sauna, you're absorbing that um, a huge amount of infrared energy, and we found that. Infrared energy, infrared is the key element in building easy water. Uh, a very tiny amount of infrared light um, can expand the exclusion zone by a factor of 10. It's really mm. powerful and specific. So visible light doesn't do it. Ultraviolet light doesn't do it. But infrared light is supremely powerful uh, in, in doing it. So you're sitting in a sauna. Uh, you're receiving that. You take off your clothing, which means that you absorb even even more of it. Um, uh, uh, and and you know, and after 20, 30 minutes, you come out feeling good. So you you may you may enter into the uh, sauna feeling um, feeling exhausted uh, and maybe a few pains here and there, and you come out feeling really good. And I think the reason is so simple: is that the infrared energy builds easy water we confirmed that and your cells need easy water uh, to perform well so so there you go you asked for one i gave you one. <laughs> thank you yeah because i usually say to people because we've got trillions of cells in our body and i've seen them under the microscope because there's so many um you know you can have live blood analysis today and see your own cells and just from a tiny pinprick you see thousands of cells so I say, it's, you know, they're moving, so they're touching each other and it's friction. So obviously if you rub your hands together, you can feel the heat. And then just by pulling your hands apart, you'll feel some things. And we know that we're electric beings because we go to hospitals and we can have ECG, EKG, and so forth to see the, the recording. And 
You talked about droplets and you also talked about we've got easy water in our cells because if we're two thirds water, you know, a lot of people would say, OK, if we have a cut, why doesn't it come gushing out? You know, like um, when you turn on the shower or the hot water tap or cold water tap. Well, absolutely. This is uh, this clear evidence that that the water in our cells is not just plain old liquid water because uh, a cut will, will cause that water to come come gushing out. But it doesn't come gushing out. The blood does come out, but not much of the water. And the reason is that the cells are filled with easy water and easy water by its very nature, it sticks to the surfaces that nucleate them. So it may be protein, it may be nucleic acid inside the cell, but the water is sticking to it, the easy water, the fourth phase water is sticking. So it doesn't want to come out. And if you could somehow pull it out, which there are ways to pull out of, uh, pull it out, you, you find a gooey substance that's sort of like raw egg white, not liquid water. Um, so our cells were, are really filled with, with, uh, with this stuff. Um, but regrettably, the textbooks have not caught up with it. So what we learn in the textbook is that the water in our bodies is just liquid water, plain old liquid water. Mm. And if you if you start with that assumption, that wrong, erroneous assumption, then you wind up with mechanisms um, that are very, very complicated because they're not right. Uh, you know, nature mm. nature works. Um, I, I I believe that the principle of Occam's razor, uh, if if you're uh, aware of that, came. Uh, I think about eight centuries ago, from Sir William of Ockham, who said um, he was he was talking about God, and you know he said there are two hypotheses: one is God exists, and the other is God doesn't exist, and and um, and so therefore you have two hypotheses, and if you want to find out, find out which one is right, take the simplest one; it's likely to be the the correct one, whether it's that God does exist or God doesn't exist, the, the simple one. And then a few centuries later, Isaac Newton thought this was a cool idea. And he said it should apply in science at all. And he said mechanisms should work by the, quote, shortest way possible. In other words, the simplest way possible. And science followed uh, Newton uh, for a few centuries. And you know, virtually every scientist knew that basic principles were simple. Uh, and if, if they were not simple, they were probably not right. That changed. Uh, maybe a century ago, and with the advent of quantum mechanics and such, and 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 so, you know, we we no longer talk about simplicity. Um, uh, we talk about about uh, abstract mathematics, and some of us, um, and I'm included, uh, feel that mm -hmm. Mother Nature doesn't work by abstract mathematics. Mother Nature likes to work by simplicity, and so. Um, I, I I maintain a certain degree of skepticism about all of the mathematically based ideas, abstract ideas, and I think Mother Nature, in her wisdom, uh, operates with a degree of simplicity. So my own my own approach is um, in any area of science, if the mechanism is too hard for me to understand, either it's due to my limited intellect or it's wrong. And I used to think it was due to my limited uh, intellect. And I now find out that I think it might be wrong. You know, these mechanisms all come down to, to uh, contributions from human beings. And we all know yeah. that human beings can be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so a lot yeah. of science it, it develops uh, that way. And in my, my own point of view is begin with a foundation of simplicity. And if you want to get to the right answer, that's the way to go. And so I, I, I myself find, you know, I've been studying water and I studied muscle contraction, and I'm now uh, in into other areas where the same principle of simplicity, uh, you know, I think really must apply. And um, so I can just tell you, for for example. Um, uh, I, I've done a few presentations about earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, now, what on earth does this have to do with easy water? Well, there's a lot of water um, down below us, uh, so-called primary water. And um, if the primary water 
uh, is near hydrophilic surfaces beneath the earth, it's going to do the same thing as what we found and reported in that book. It, so if so, you know, you, you've got easy water that's clinging to the surfaces below. And at the same time, you've got protons. Uh, remember, the charges need to be e equalized. And, uh, and so you've got protons floating around. And those protons repel one another. They want to get away from one another as much as possible. So when you think about the energy that underlies volcanoes, for example, you raise the question, um, is it possible that these protons, these these charges, when when they build up uh, sufficiently, uh, they'll break through and cause a volcanic eruption? Well, you know, volcanoes produce, they're mostly water that comes out. Um, and uh, the... Um, volcanic eruption of, uh, I think it was called Tanga Tanga or something, in the past year, um, it was theorized that, that it increased the, the water content of the atmosphere by 5%. Imagine wow. one volcano increasing. By, so it's a lot of water that's obviously not just water, but there's a lot of water that comes out. And you can also, if you peruse the internet, look at images, you can see lightning coming out out of the volcanic eruption and mm. so i'm just giving you as an, an example of um, um you know application of, of easy water to a phenomena that you never think would would you know would be related and the same with earthquakes where does the energy come from um the the you you can you can surmise that the earth was endowed with a whole lot of energy at its birth and it's using that but you know, it's been it's been a few years since the Earth's birth. You know, not a thousand years or a million years even, but I think about four or five billion uh, years. And you'd think if the Earth was endowed with a, a kind of energy that by now, you know, it's been a long time. You wouldn't have too much of that, but we get earthquakes and volcanoes all the time, and maybe they're even increasing. So the energy has got to come from somewhere. And yeah, yeah, I'm just giving you an example of of how um, um, not only- I know um, on an energetic level, every time there's a natural disaster, the communities come together and really, you know, build as one. And usually um, like tsunamis, Michiko said, usually when there's a tsunami, it's all the man-made stuff that disappears and it's only nature that's left. And, uh, spiritually, you know, I think we're entering an era where spirituality and um, science are blending, and it's all about following the steps of nature and keeping it um, simple. Because look at the trees and the flowers, you know, they grow so easily. And if a flower's wilting, you give it some water and it springs back to life. And, you know, they're happy just being a tree or a flower or something else but they know who they are and what they are and everything happens naturally in our bodies we're not thinking is my heart beating am I breathing and so forth everything you know is happening magnificently and we forget and then we complicate it with um so much um taking pills and this that and the other and instead we can just relax and just be but um we talked about sailing earlier and I used to love doing the twilights because you see the fluorescence coming up on the water, which is really beautiful. And my partner, because I was, we were both listening to one of your talks about the clouds and as you said about the droplets, because obviously we're sailing to different currents of water and it could be a warm current and obviously then the warm air rises and then you meet cooler air and um, clouds form. And he said um, to ask you, because he heard you say that the earth is negatively charged, not neutral. Um, he said, the earth does also have magnetic fields. So if the earth has a magnetic field, it must have a positive and negative poles. That also implies that the earth is positive and negative and just not one or the other. 
So he gave the example, if you have a magnet and spin it inside a copper coil, you get the electricity. So it is understandable that the earth would have electrical fields because it is a spinning magnet or would you well, agree with that yeah. or not? He's, well, he's well, happy uh, to be challenged. <laughs> well, I would challenge <laughs> uh, uh, The earth absolutely does have an electric field uh, and the electric field lines run from uh, up above and somewhere high in the atmosphere to the earth. Uh, it's like a capacitor, you know, you have two capacitor yeah. plates and the field lines run from from the positive to the negative, they run down this way. And that that's observed for the earth. It's just that we don't learn about, many of us don't learn about it. As I said, I studied electrical engineering and no professor yeah. ever told me about anything like that. I learned this from the Russians who seem to know everything about everything uh, <laughs> scientifically. And um, so, yeah, so there's, there's um, um, an electric field over and above the magnetic field. And, um, you know, I think what, what you're alluding to, if I understand, is that the suggestion that it's the magnetic field that gives rise to the electric field. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that that's necessarily uh, correct, because all you need is a separation of charge uh, to get an electric field. And we, we know, uh, or at least I found out, um, um, uh, through initially speaking with another Russian that the earth was negative and and up there in somewhere in the high in the troposphere or atmosphere there are positive charges and if they're positive here and negative you must have an electric field and people have measured the electric field at the surface of the earth and also above it's about 100 volts per meter um, and I you know I think uh, this is maybe independent of the magnetic field although Perhaps it's worthy of, of, of some discussion. And, you know, the atmosphere, I mean, this electric field is important because you raise a question of, for example, what keeps the atmosphere clinging to the earth? You just think about it, uh, you know, um, you've got the air, the oxygen, nitrogen, a little yeah. bit of argon for spice um, and sitting above the earth and you've got winds and why doesn't the wind just blow the atmosphere away? Uh, mm. Maybe you haven't thought about that. Uh, most people haven't thought about it, but you know the question is why. And I think the answer is very simple, and it relates to the electric field that you mentioned. Um, you know, if if the atmosphere is positively charged and the Earth is negatively charged, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the two are going to be attracted to one another. Mm. I think it's as simple as that. The atmosphere is held on to the Earth because. Because the atmosphere is positive and the Earth is negative, so the two stick. Uh, uh, you know, it's another simple example of, uh, or an example of the simplicity, simplicity yeah. of, of nature. If you if you're on to what you know, I believe is is the correct answer, then it comes out simply. It's not complicated. You don't have to, you don't have to in, in, invent seriously complicated theories to explain um, how this works. If they're really complicated, it's a sign that you're on to the yeah. wrong wrong idea. But at least, I, I pardon me, that's the way I operate. <laughs> no, that's fine. I operate exactly the same way. And I've just got a couple of quick questions. I got loads, so I think we'll have to have another talk at some stage. Sure. But um, because of you mentioned God a few times, um, and also ancient religious gurus felt for certain that the water was endowed with exotic healing powers. And there's many countries around the world. And I'll just say about Lords in France, because I know a cousin went there years ago to heal her. She was crippled with arthritis and it really helped. You know, what, what are your thoughts uh, about that? And have you looked at any, any of the molecules from healing water? Yeah, various colleagues have, have have done that. We we haven't so much, but some of the uh, spring waters, uh, in, including uh, from Lourdes, I, um, I I I believe they contain easy water. And I remember I remember seeing a slide at a a, a conference, I mean, maybe a dozen years ago, and I was really curious, looking 
And these people had studied the healing waters, not only from Lourdes, but other places where they, there yeah. are no healing waters. And I looked for a sign of easy water. That sign is usually uh, the absorption of light at a wavelength of 270 nanometers. Um, this, is, this is our standard. Uh, we've come to see it numerous times. And, and so I, I remember seeing it from Lourdes and, um, and, and there are colleagues of mine who, who look at spring waters and do spectroscopic measurements similar to what I, what I just described. And uh, I've seen the results and they vary, but some of the spring waters contain uh, huge amounts of easy water and some, some less. And I, I can't remember about, about Lourdes, I, uh, whether it was a lot or not so much, but I think the answer lies in, uh, uh, I would suggest that perhaps the answer lies in that. So if you, you know, if you drink, if you drink easy water, or if you drink water, I should say liquid water that contains appreciable amounts of easy water, because you can't get, uh, I, I think it may be impossible to get pure easy water um, for reasons we could discuss. But, but if you drink waters like spring waters with appreciable amounts of easy in them, uh, what you're doing is you're, you're bypassing the need to, when you drink ordinary liquid water, it gets converted to easy water. But if you drink the easy water, you don't need to undergo the conversion. It happens naturally. And, and, and so it may be that your, your friend who, who drank the water, um, your friend got ample amounts of easy water from uh, yeah. Lourdes. And it was a restoration of easy water in her, her cells could be that we're responsible for, um, for for reversing the dysfunction. Uh, I think it's critically important that if if what I've been telling you is correct, then a simple yeah. therapeutic route is to increase the easy water in your cells. And I, I gave the sauna as one example, but this is another example. Just drink it. <laughs> You know, and you can also. But where take, can people buy easy water? Uh, well, there are various companies that tout their water as containing easy, and you know, to convince me that they need to do the experiment to really verify that they've got it. I, I feel honored that a lot of companies say, "Hey, well, this contains fourth phase water, easy water." That you know, we made a bit of impact, but I, I really, I think one needs to see the experimental evidence before. For accepting yeah. it. Yeah. It's not. I know not, a friend of mine in, in Brazil. Sorry, he's, um, I sent you a link. He's um, Celsius, um, worked with five scientists there because they said the Brazil water in Brazil is really bad, is very contaminated, and that most pe people don't even like drinking the bottled water. And um, He's got a board with sacred, sacred geometry shapes and he puts crystals and magnets. And he said, if you leave the um, glass of water on for eight hours, then it's like what I think could be like easy water because he said all the cells, you know, move out. Could be. Yeah, it could well yeah. be. Yeah. You know, I think that's going to be in the future one of the, the solutions to health problems is so simple. And, you know, another way to do it is to just go in your backyard and take some fresh plant, take the leaves, crush them, squeeze out the water and drink that water. That water is the water from inside the plant cells and, you know, fresh new leaves uh, from plant cells are just filled with easy water. So you're drinking it directly. And, you yeah. know, I've heard from various providers uh, that their patients come and you know, uh, suffering from this or that. And they advise the patients to do exactly what I've described. And then they come back months later and yeah. whatever it was they were suffering, it, it has improved uh, greatly. Uh, yeah, well, as you know, there's so much evidence that water contains information and memory from homeopaths and amazing scientists. And... Um, a lot of them now I'm hearing is that water is consciousness. Well, so yeah. I was wondering your thoughts on that. Well, we're studying that right now. Um, you know, oh, in, cool. Inspired by Emoto and yeah. uh, from the spiritual angle. And um, 
you know, Veda Austin is someone from yeah. New Zealand who who's taken up this and studying uh, it, it with techniques that are some of them are like Emoto, but she's focusing on the repeatability. Uh, I've advised her to do that. And yeah, that's that's, that's re really really important um, uh, to 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 be. But we're testing this in our own laboratory. So our our experiments, which are just getting underway, we take um, we take a container, a glass of water, and uh, we yeah. put it in the laboratory, and we have a healer uh, who you know can can heal uh, or um, it reputedly is able to heal people and the healer comes and does her healing uh, to to the water and then we test the water to see if the physical or physical chemical properties of the water are altered by this healing we have no results yet but but mm -hmm. you know this follows in, in general the ideas that began with emoto uh, uh, yeah. that there is there is a kind of spiritual energy or some kind of informational energy uh, yeah. that's converted to the water and it was found even even before then or maybe simultaneously by the french scientist jacques benveniste who basically lost his his uh, uh his esteem in the field of water by suggesting that water had memory uh yeah good evidence it's now confirmed by many groups but he was demolished uh demolished by the editor of nature uh for coming through and says a preposterous idea for which he had yeah. clear evidence but the editor said i don't care what your evidence is it can't be true uh, it can't be true because if you're right everybody else is wrong and i refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong and he basically lost his career um it became a scientific wow. joke, you know ben Venice. so it's um you have memory memory problems just just drink some of jacques ben Venice water because it has memory <laughs> you know and, mm was taken as a as a joke which yeah you know he felt uh, he was he was being demeaned and uh, and he was obviously demoralized by all that because his career as a uh, an esteemed scientist went precipitously downhill so water memory is is um i guess i might summarize by saying you know it it sounds woo woo and and it sounds like it's preposterous to think that water has memory the evidence, on the other hand, uh, from so many quarters, including uh, Luc Montagnier, uh, Nobel laureate, yeah. just passed a year ago. He used to come to yeah. our conference each year and present his stuff. When, you know, when you have serious scientists who are doing work in this and have evidence that is consistent with that idea, you have to begin to think, well, maybe there's something to it, despite the fact that we think it's it's weird um there are lots yeah. of things that seem weird you know and now we accept them as truths uh, so. yeah i um actually stumbled across Beta austin's work and i bought her book is like a guide to show you how to put the water samples in you know step-by-step -step book guide and how to say the words but to befriend the water and lead up to yes. getting a conversation going and it's just before the water turns completely ice so it's still some liquid and i think um the first one i did was in melbourne water and my mother-in-law told me that um she heard on the news that melbourne water was the best water in the world allegedly so i had a little conversation saying to the tap water i know you're supposed to be the best water in the world however I'm just starting a communication with you. And if you meant, if you'd like to show me something, that would be great. And I had a heart with a dolphin inside. I think I sent it to you and Jerry because the day he introduced me was when I did the test. And I was just like blown away because dolphins are my spirit guide. And I'm doing photos every, not every day, but whenever I can. And Veda said that you'd been mentoring her and that um, you should do a test, the same test for at least three times. And I was going to ask you, you know, is that good? So, example, if you put the word love, you should do it three times. And uh, so, I, I'm so glad to hear that she said that to you because I've been trying to convince her um, yeah. that, 
it, this is the essence in order to be believed um, you need yeah. to repeat the experiment and see I don't know three times is the ideal time but I think she's been doing that we had a long conversation uh, by zoom and, uh, mm -hmm. and she told me and she had a whole bunch of people working with her she said that she's been doing repeat experiments for uh, repeating and she finds that 75 to 80 percent of the time uh, she it, the repeat experiment is successful and that's amazing if it, if it's that much I would have I, I would have been satisfied with 50 percent of the time about 80 percent is amazing yeah she mentioned you in her book as well she, and she, oh, did she mention she, it in the book I I, I yeah I remember that okay yeah yeah so uh, yeah yeah so how is, many uh, um times would do you have to do a test to patent it oh i i don't know that depends on the patent officer who's reviewing it um okay uh are you thinking about doing that uh, oh not at all i'm just putting the question out there for the listeners and obviously you're a scientist and you you keep repeating tests repeating tests repeating tests and you know well, and the, I, yeah, it, I it, also it, know that you get other scientists around the world doing your experiments to see if they get the same results. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with, in in general, with with doing that in the case of water, is, is that you don't know, or it's not known, what factors might influence the water, and therefore, you can't necessarily expect to get a hundred percent repeatability because. You know, it it might be that uh, suddenly a sunspot appears, and that has an impact on the water, or you know, the phase of the moon, or some cosmic energy comes. It's simply not known, and and therefore, if mm. these influence water, uh, then you're going to get results that do don't that vary that don't necessarily uh, re give the same result a hundred percent of the time. So. Um, that needs to be taken into account, and a lot of scientists uh, are may, maybe not aware of, of this issue. So I wouldn't expect in any experiment involving water that you would necessarily have 100% repeatability. Some scientists demand that you know it has to be 100% repeatable, but it, it can't be if there are variables that we don't know about, mm. and they play a role. Yeah, yeah maybe electric field, somebody turns on turns on uh, uh, some electrical device uh, in, the, in the laboratory and that has an impact. You don't know, let me see. But anyway, yeah. if anybody who's doing this experiment, yourself or Veda Austin or yeah. uh, Emoto, the, the repeatability issue is really, really important. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you for giving up your precious time today. And okay. I will put, I'll put your social media notes when we publish this um, recording. And what is the best way to people contact you if they wanted to donate money to you, for example, or just to follow you? Well, if, if donate money, if, if it's a you know small amount of money, um, uh, um, uh, on, on our website, there's a, a pollocklab.org there's a way to donate if it's a possibility which we would absolutely welcome a substantial amount because you know it to get a pay for a student or postdoc it's almost a hundred thousand dollars a year and wow. uh, something like that please write directly to me to uh, discuss i'm my email is all over the place it's very easy it's ghp for gerald harvey pollock ghp at uw University of Washington, uw.edu. That's ghp at uw.edu. And I'll be happy to discuss uh, with you. We we would really welcome any any kind of interest because um, to maintain the lab, we need support. And it, it, it's not so easy to get that support. Uh, lots of people seem to be intensely interested uh, in all the things that we do, both fundamental and and applied but that doesn't always translate into money <laughs> so yeah well fingers crossed we'll put the right yeah. vibes out there for you well so. yeah it says i'm
coming to Australia or, or early August, I'd be happy to chat with um, anybody who is in a position of wanting to discuss a possible donation or anything else. I'm down. Yeah, so, great. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it, Beverly. Uh, Pleasure. Uh, yeah. Thank you.